This is part two of the spring 2011 update on the Victoria Regional Rapid Transit Project. This part is an overview of the evaluation of technology options for the Victoria to West Shore Rapid Transit Connection, leading to the recommendation for LRT. In considering rapid transit technology options, we first began with a base case, which we called business as usual. Doing nothing is not an option, especially given the obligation to double ridership. But arguably, things could be done to improve things without the investment in rapid transit. This would involve adding more conventional buses to run in mixed traffic, with transit priority measures like bus lanes, bus on shoulder arrangements, and head of the line queue jumping signals. Against that base case, we evaluated the two primary rapid transit options. The first was bus rapid transit, or BRT. This would run specialized high capacity diesel hybrid buses on an exclusive right of way. It would have high frequency service so there'd be no need for a schedule, and fares would be collected before boarding. There would be near level boarding from station platforms. The other is light rail transit, or LRT. This would run even higher capacity electric rail cars on a track which provides an exclusive right of way. It would also have high frequency service without the need for a schedule, and would also have off board fare collection. Station platforms would give level boarding. To compare the advantages and disadvantages of each option, the project team performed what's called a multiple account evaluation. This is a process that compares each option in terms of land use and urban development, transportation benefits, economic development, social community benefits, and others. It's a tool that's used worldwide to evaluate transportation projects, and it's a requirement to determine if the investment of public money is justified. To compare the benefits, the process began with a description of the options the required fleet size, the ridership increase, capacity differences. For example, business as usual would have a peak hour capacity of 2,000 passengers, while BRT could handle a little bit more at 2,400, and LRT could carry up to 4,600 passengers per hour. These are important to determine which system could meet the ridership objectives. Then there's the cost to construct or establish with $250 million for business as usual, $520 million for BRT, and $950 million for LRT. Total life cycle costs were factored in, that is the capital investment plus operating costs to 2038, and the operating cost per passenger was also calculated. Travel time savings were included to help measure the transportation benefits. Both BRT and LRT would provide an immediate 20-minute time savings over the hour-long bus trip from the West Shore to downtown, and be as fast as going by car. And by 2038, because of growing road congestion, the rapid transit time advantage over a conventional bus would be 50 minutes, and the trip would even be half an hour faster than it would be by car. Then began the evaluation of the various accounts, comparing BRT and LRT to business as usual. Some of these are quantitative or measurable, while others are qualitative or requiring knowledgeable consideration more than measurement and most require some understanding of the results experienced elsewhere and how relevant that experience elsewhere is here. So you can see here how BRT is better than business as usual and LRT is better than BRT for property values, ridership, smooth comfortable ride, and community acceptability. BRT and LRT are tied but both beat business as usual for reliability and connectivity. BRT costs more and has more constructability challenges than business as usual, and LRT even more so, and BRT has a higher benefit cost ratio. LRT comes up best and BRT second best for economic development, job creation, safety and health benefits, and emission reductions. BRT comes up about the same as business as usual when it comes to the system creating a bit of a barrier to the community, while LRT fares worse. Both BRT and LRT obviously have more of an impact during construction than business as usual, and the establishment of an exclusive right-of-way would require the acquisition of some land. The bottom line, both BRT and LRT have more benefits than costs. And while BRT has the higher benefit cost ratio, it will reach capacity within 10 to 15 years and fall short of achieving the ridership objectives. LRT provides the highest absolute benefits. 
As a long-term solution, LRT is capable of meeting the doubled ridership and 12% transit mode share targets. Indeed, experience elsewhere has shown that it takes LRT to actually realize the 12% mode share. LRT also does the most to reduce greenhouse gases. BRT could do the job in the short term, but upgrading to LRT when it reaches capacity would be quite costly and disruptive. Here are the top reasons LRT is being recommended as the rapid transit solution to connect Victoria to the West Shore. It's the only technology with the capacity to achieve Provincial Transit Plan ridership targets. It'll attract the most ridership. It provides the greatest comfort and safety, has the highest community support, and will be most effective at reducing roadway congestion. It provides the best support for the capital region's emphasis on transit-oriented development and delivers $85 million more land value increases than BRT. It provides the longest service life and is the only technology where the cost per passenger actually goes down over time. It has a positive benefit-cost ratio and the highest transportation benefits overall, a billion dollars more than BRT over 27 years. It'll create 4,500 more job years of employment, and it will result in the greatest reduction of greenhouse gases by 145,000 tons more than BRT, which is like taking 24,000 vehicles off the road during the life of the project. Now, while it makes the most sense to use the technology that will do the job rather than one that won't, affordability is an obvious consideration. So the team is looking at an implementation strategy that would allow the system to be introduced in stages and expanded as demand increases. Building the entire system from downtown to Station Avenue right out of the gate has its advantages. It provides the best service and benefits, but it has the highest cost to construct at $950 million and it will initially have some excess capacity between Six Mile and Juan de Fuca and even more between Juan de Fuca and Station Avenue. So one staging option is to build LRT as far as Juan de Fuca, with conventional buses using the rest of the transit way to feed into it. It would reduce the upfront cost by $90 million while providing most of the benefits. The other staging option is to build LRT as far as Six Mile, with conventional buses using the rest of the transit way to feed into it. That would save another $90 million up front, yet still provide important benefits. Funding is a major consideration. Funding normally comes from local sources with some provincial support. The local share is made up of fares, advertising, fuel tax, and property taxes. To fund a capital project, the local share is financed like a mortgage. The cost is recovered over the useful life of the asset. For a project of this size, BC Transit will be looking for funding from both the provincial and federal governments. Until the cost-sharing agreement is developed, we won't know what the impact would be on local property taxes. Two possible scenarios are shown here. The first is based on the traditional funding formula, while the second is based on bringing in another funding partner. An important thing to note here is that business as usual alone would require a $100 increase in property taxes just to try to maintain service levels and would be unlikely to attract another funding partner. As the multiple account evaluation showed, the rapid transit solution costs more but delivers hugely more in value and benefits. There may be other ways to reduce the impact on property taxes. In our dialogue with the public and stakeholders, we've been urged to investigate other sources of funding. Sources such as fuel tax increases, community passes, parking taxes, capital reserves, vehicle levies, land development grants, and fare strategies. Many of these ideas will take some time to develop and may require some legislative change. However, as we seek approval for this project and move into the next phase, we will continue to investigate funding options that would help alleviate the pressure on property taxes. Extensive research, analysis, and consultation have led to the conclusion that more roads won't solve our congestion problems. We need to make better use of the limited corridors we have available. A convenient and reliable rapid transit system supported by forward-thinking land use policies is a measure focused on moving people rather than vehicles. The travel time advantage will make transit much more attractive to the many people who have a choice in the mode of transportation they use. And because it's not just the population but the geographic conditions that shape our travel patterns, there is no doubt 
that the capital region will generate the ridership to sustain an LRT system between Victoria and the West Shore.